welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Our guest today, for the first of a two-part chat, is one of America's most distinguished and experienced critics of theater, film, and literature, John Simon. Welcome to the show, John. Thank, thank you. Uh, I am not a, a big reader of reviews, but when I read your reviews, I'm, I'm often enchanted because your, your writing is magnificent. Now, you were not born in this country. Where were you born? I was born in the former Yugoslavia, the part which is now Serbia, and I'm of mixed Hungarian and Yugoslav descent. I came to this country when I was just under 16, 15 and a half. How did, how did you perfect your English? Well, uh, I love languages, and I speak several of them. Which and ones do you speak? I'm curious. Well, obviously, Serbo-Croatian and Hungarian, German, which was my first language, actually, because my parents wanted me to learn a foreign language in the cradle. Not a bad idea. Um, and um, what, let's see, French, did we say that? French, English, German. Serbo Croatian and uh, Hungarian, and a little bit of Italian. When I'm in Italy, it comes back, and when I leave Italy, it goes away. And now you are uh, uh, like uh, Joseph Conrad. You, you've mastered English. You, you, uh, uh, you intimidate me with your knowledge of English, and uh, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. Well, I have to confess. Uh, well, so you uh, can choose to have me either correct it or not have No, it. I want you to correct me. <laughs> uh, be my guest to correct me, too. And uh, uh, now, uh, for our audience who may not know your work, you have, uh, you have been a critic of film, television. No, and not television. No, film, uh, film theater. Books. Books. And you've worked for such, uh, you've written in such organizations, such magazines as uh, a New York Magazine for 37 years, The Hudson Review, New Criterion, uh, New York Times uh, uh, Book Review. You are um, an extraordinary, uh, you have a track record and a knowledge of, uh, of several fields. Which is your favorite? Well, just for the hell of it, we should mention that I wrote about art, too. Not a lot, but some. And I like art. Well, which is my favorite? I mean, I don't think I have favorites. I'm sort of like those mothers who have, let's say, five children and who quite admirably don't prefer one of them to the others. Well, judging from the conversations we've been having this, uh, this morning, we talked about opera. You have an extraordinary knowledge of opera, more than a passing knowledge. It's a, it's a connoisseur's knowledge of opera. I, it sounds like you love opera. I do. I love opera, yes. Uh, and I manage to do it despite the fact that I'm heterosexual. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't found it an impediment. No, no. I'm Not glad. yet, anyway. <laughs> uh, your latest book is Dreamer of Dreams. Essays on. No, that's po not the latest book. No, that's no. the one that you gave me. What is the latest the book? The latest are three books John Simon on theater, John Simon on film, and John Simon on music. Right. Collections I, of my writings on those subjects. I just finished uh, reading John Simon on theater. Well, you see, that's the. And late. On every, uh, in every other essay, I had to look up a word. Uh, my favorite word that I had to look up was daedal. Deedle, actually. Uh, Deedle? <laughs> yes. Deedle. Comes from Daedalus, the man who made the labyrinth. And it means skillfulness in crafting, in making something. I, I loved it. I love to have a word like that in my vocabulary. Well, I keep hearing from a lot of people that they read me not for what I say, but for the words that they can learn. I don't care as long as they read me. <laughs> Uh, now you are a uh, New York theater critic for Bloomberg News mm -hmm. and a theatrical columnist for Broadway.com. Uh, 
what uh, um, what is the difference f for you for writing for uh, an online publication? Well, it's a big difference because I am an old-fashioned person who likes to see something that's black on white and that one can hold in one's hands and that doesn't fade away and that you can sort of look at and come back to and stop and and that means print and not uh, the web. Also, there is something about writing for Bloomberg News, which is that it's sort of news-oriented. And for example, I reviewed an opera for them, which the main editor said, this would be very good for a music magazine, but it's not good for a news medium. So there is that problem. Mm -hmm. How did you happen to become a critic? Well, I think it's born into you, uh, like so many things. Um, it's a critical attitude towards life, towards what you read, towards what you're exposed to. It comes somehow, I think, from birth. And uh, I started out as a poet, mind you, and I was a published poet. But I think my real métier was and is criticism. And I think How did that first manifest itself? Well, I think in my voicing strong likes or dislikes for things that I saw or read or heard, and then gradually it translated itself into written stuff. I think it came from speech originally. And also my writing does come, my prose writing does come from poetry. I think that's what makes it interesting. I uh, use certain devices from poetry, rhythm and assonance and uh, alliteration and various other things that, that do come from poetry. May I give an example of that? If you wish. Uh, this is uh, from your review of Peter Brooks's Mahabharata. Uh, I th think this is a gem. These actors are recruited from the first, second, and third worlds, and some of them from out of this world. They dedicate long hours and years to acquiring the Brookian style, which means that they are either fanatical cultists or unemployable anywhere else. <laughs> How they sound in French at their headquarters, I don't know. But in English, they enrich Hindu mythology with the story of the Tower of Babel, what with accents ranging from the opaque to the inscrutable, and even when scrutable, cacophonous. <laughs> I think that's exactly what you might mean. It's, a, it's, a, it's an aria. Yes, I try that. I, I believe in cadence. I believe in occasional but very careful use of rhyme, which can be very bad in prose, and so on and so forth. Anaphora, for example. How did you become a critic? What was the process? When were you first published? How did that happen for you? Well, I think it happened at Harvard. Uh, I think I may have done something in high school that Horace Mann that qualified as perhaps criticism. But basically, it was Harvard when I started reviewing for not the obvious place, uh, not the advocate and not the lampoon, but for a little publication, a little flyleaf publication called Audience. I think that was the real beginning. And, you know, it then went from little to bigger things. Oh, were you always writing in this, uh, what it became your, your, your mode, this, uh, um, your style? Did well, style yes, develop? I mean, in, in Audience, there was a review that had a sentence or two in it that I still think are among my best. It was a production of Cocteau's Orphée, in which a horse is seen standing in a niche, so that you only see half of the horse. And Orphée, Orpheus, the main character, consults it. And I said, when Paul Schmidt, in a, poet, poet, in a poet's theater production um, of Orphée, generally living beyond its means, uh, at the end of Act One, conducts a conversation with the front part of a horse, the production finally manages to make ends meet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Paul Schmidt was a close friend of mine. He was a nice guy. 
but not as Orpheus. He was a very good translator of Chekhov. Yes, he, Russians. Uh, Chlebnikov he did yes. too, and yeah, yeah. He's go he was good. And uh, I, I saw him in wonderful productions uh, after that, um, a constructivist production, uh, uh, remarkable. By the way, in, uh, I forgot to mention, in this particular sentence, I said when Paul Schmidt assuriently kisses, that might have been a word too. Assuriently? Assuriently, which means eating with great gusto, enjoying ah. uh, you, what you eat. Um, who were your role models as critics? Well, Did you have any? Yeah, I'm, I've been asked that many times. I liked Dwight MacDonald a lot. And oh, I can see that, yeah. And we were friends, and he wrote the introduction to my first book, which was a very peculiar introduction. It was more like a critique, which doesn't <laughs> belong in, a, in an introduction. But anyway, I, I probably learned something from him. I may have learned something from James Agee, whom I liked although we are very, diff different, very different. Tem different temperamentally, but um, I'm trying to think, perhaps Edmund Wilson, more likely than not. Shaw? Probably, although I didn't get to read Shaw till later, um, but Wilson probably, and um, some others that I'll think of when this program is over and I'll start kicking my shins. When you began uh, 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 being a critic, where did you first do it professionally? I guess uh, in the Hudson Review, I think. That must have been the first. Do you remember what the first uh, assignment was? Not really, but it can be looked up in my, in, in my book. I see. Uh, I know you, uh, I read somewhere that you worked uh, for he Lillian Hellman. Uh, or yes. a spell. Yes. What was that like? Lillian Hellman, the playwright and the uh, novelist. And it was and more a nightmare than a spell. How so? Well, she was a pain in the ass, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, No, she, he and a colleague of mine, we were both teaching at MIT in humanities at the time. He actually was asked by her to do a sample translation of passages from Anui's The Lark which she was going to do on Broadway. And, of course, she claimed to know French, but she didn't. And Defendini, his name, and I were supposed to uh, do sample translations from various characters so that she'd get the feel of how they speak, which from a sort of trot translation, which some graduate student from Columbia did, she couldn't get that. So we did it, and she underpaid us horrendously. And Defendini said, the hell with her. And I said, yeah, the hell with her, but I'm going to try to collect money from her anyway. And it was a very unpleasant experience. Uh, have you ever tried to, have you ever been a playwright yourself? Yes, in a very small way. Uh, I ran the Harvard Radio Workshop, and we did radio plays, or we adapted stage plays for the radio, and I did some of those. And I did write one, I did write one stage play a short one, uh, which was actually produced for war relief because it was about 10 Yugoslav girls being serially raped by German officers during World War II, uh, which of course took place off stage. But when I read the play in a writing class of Robert Hillier's at Harvard, uh, Maurizio Obregon, who was later culture minister of of Colombia said, it would have been more interesting if the offstage had been the onstage. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But yeah, it was called Death There Is None, and my fans went around Harvard changing it by crossing out two letters, so it read, Death Here Is One. <laughs> <laughs> so I gather that isn't a, uh, a, a desire of yours, you're not a, a frustrated uh, um, artist in that sense. No, for a while in the Harvard Library there was a listing in the catalog, John Simon Playwright, and this play appeared there even though I was the same John Simon who was not the playwright. When, uh, when you began being a reviewer, uh, was the profession different than it is now? Well, the profession was insofar different as everything else is different now. We live in an era of tremendous dumbing down. 
there isn't anything from architecture, well, maybe not architecture, it does fairly well, but let's say from painting to plumbing that hasn't been dumbed down. And thanks to television and thanks to um, the web, which could be a good thing, but in practice often is not, um, we've been dumbed down. We've been dumbed down colossally, and it reflects in every field. Certainly it reflects in television, which was once halfway civilized and isn't anymore. You mean the, uh, uh, the, the, the so-called golden age of... Uh well, that too. There were some decent plays, but above all, there was int intelligent conversation. There was, the, there was Cavett, there was Frost, there was Susskind. There were all kinds of talk shows which had a modicum of interest and culture to them. That's all gone. And the, and the review, the profession of reviewing was similarly more literate? More yes, it was, it was. Um, in, the, in the very best media, I think, the standard has been maintained. Mm -hmm. You can read the new criterion from cover to cover, and regardless of what the review is of, it'll be good and, and very readable, too. But that's not true of other publications, not to mention uh, video. Were you always uh, uh, reviewing uh, uh, theater, uh, opera, literature, uh, all of it, all at once, film, or did you grow into uh, uh, other uh, different genres? Yeah, well, I came to opera later, but the others, the others, I did from the beginning, including art to to some extent. Uh, how has that world changed? How is the, uh, from your point of view? How has the world of theater changed? Uh, what, is, uh, what was it like for you to go to the theater in the, the quote, the old days? Well, in the old days, one had a 50-50 chance of enjoying what one saw. Now one has a 5%, if that, chance to enjoy what one <coughs> sees. Does uh, this mean the quality of the, of the new works is, is yeah. lower? Yes, uh, yes. The actors are still good actors. There are even a few good directors left. Certainly the set designers and the costume designers and sometimes the composers who do stage music are still pretty good and even very good. But the actual writing, with a few, with a few honorable exceptions, uh, is, is not good. Who, who were your favorites when you first started reviewing among the writers? Well, like everybody else, I, I loved Tennessee Williams. But unlike everybody else, I did not love Arthur Miller. And right. And I still don't. Um, but there were others whom I liked. I certainly liked Chekhov and Ibsen and Shakespeare and those things, which were done quite a bit in those days. And even, you know, things like Pirandello, for example, which one doesn't see at all anymore and others that one could mention. When you first started out, the uh, theater was uh, uh, in New York was centered... Oh, in sorry, let me... Uh, O'Neill, we should mention Eugene O'Neill as one of my people. Go on, sorry. When you first started out, the theater in New York was centered on Broadway... Um, uh, Off-Broadway, was that developed? Yeah, yeah. It, it was coming along, it was coming along. And there was a production of The Iceman Cometh, which really did a lot for O'Neill. Down to the circle in the square. Yes, and it had, I Robert, saw that one. It had Robert Redford in it. I didn't know that. Yeah. Whom did he play? He played the guy who uh, killed his mother or did something horrible, I forget. Um, did something terrible. Jason for Robards was uh, oh, Jason Robards, uh, certainly. starring in it. And, uh, I, I, I remember reading in your, in your theater volume how much you liked uh, um, the, the newer production the, the, um, uh, of Iceman, who's uh, starring um, Kevin Spacey. Well, Spacey. I almost feel I discovered Kevin Spacey because I gave him a rave review in a very early Athol Fugard play he was in when people barely noticed him, or if they noticed him, didn't make much of him seemed to me this was going to be a major actor, and, and I have discovered a few actors and actresses, so to speak. And that, like that who else did you, did you feel? Well, Debbie Allen, perhaps, if that means anything to you. Uh, sure. That was one of them. Uh, she used my review to get jobs. 
Uh, and that, <laughs> that happened to some <laughs> others, too. Um, I've used your review of me to get jobs, too. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> uh, uh, it's hard to remember them all now, uh, but there were, there were quite a few in their day. I've, I've done a lot for an actress who still hasn't come into her own, even though she's beautiful, brilliant, talented, everything you could ask for, for uh, Lila Robbins. But she is now opening in Heartbreak House, and I'm hoping that that would really, really do One it One would her. think she'd be on everyone's... Uh, yeah, she's uh, beautiful, she's talented, she is unusual, she is everything, and she hasn't had a sufficient career. Has she appeared in film? I, I don't know. She's been in some very obscure minor films, but never in a, in a really <laughs> visible film. Uh, have you discovered any writers? Well, again, I don't know that I've discovered them, but, but I'm tremendously fond of Donald Margulies, for example. Right. Two of his plays, Dinner with Friends and Sight Unseen, are two of the great American plays. It's true. It's true. And Wonderful that plays. I, and some of his lesser ones are pretty good, too. So I'm, I think I've done things for him. I don't know that I've discovered him. I was very fond early on of Lanford Wilson. And right. I and I think I did things in a small way for him. You did for Lanford and for Circle Rep, where I was, uh, 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 where I worked. Uh, uh -huh. these, are, these are my friends. Yeah, there were uh, some good things at Circle Rep. And Marshall Mason. You he was wonderful, and unfortunately he went off west and we lost him. Right. Uh, and, uh, and Kevin Spacey went off east. East, yes. Well, there are all London. kinds of directions one could go <laughs> off in. Uh, the only thing one can't do is off of, which I keep hearing from people all the time, which I think is gross. He jumped off of his father's roof or something like that. Off off. That's terrible. Oof, yuck. Well, that's where I uh, grew up in the theater, uh, yeah. with Lanford at the Cafe yeah. Chino. Uh -huh, Did you yes. happen to go down there? Or? I may have gone down there. I, you know, when you read a lot about a place, you begin to think that you were there. But I couldn't swear to it. Maybe. Uh, it was uh, an extraordinary atmosphere, and that's where we all kind of grew up in the theater. And uh -huh. uh, Marshall Mason directed me in shows and uh, created shows for, for Lanford, and uh, it, w it was an extraordinary time. Uh, yeah, we should mention Sam Shepard, Sam too, Shepherd. who at his best is pretty good. He's wonderful. Buried Child is quite a play. It's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, have you, in all this time, have has your taste changed th th that you've noticed? Oh, I don't know. I hope I've become a little more tolerant and a little more Catholic in my tastes. I'm not sure, but I hope so. What kind of, what uh, do you like now that you didn't like before? Well, let me think. I'm sure there are such things, but it's hard to off the top of my head, it's because unlike James A.J., I was not a person who kept changing his mind about things and apologizing for previous reviews and rewriting previous reviews. I have changed my mind a few times, but not often. And offhand, I, I don't know, I couldn't say. But there must be cases, yeah. Would you, do you have any way of characterizing uh, what your kind of taste is? Um, I would like to say good. <laughs> I would uh, characterize it. You have very broad tastes. You're not uh, stuck in any particular direction. Well, I haven't noticed that. I think that is true. Uh, a nice compliment that was paid to me uh, by a director, now unfor unfortunately deceased, who said as I came into one of the plays that he was directing, he says, what I like about you, he said, is that you always take a shower before you go to the theater. And I said, I don't know, what does that, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, but it meant that I don't have any preconceived notions. Someone I disliked, I may now like. Someone I liked, I may now not like. Uh, they're telling me that we're, uh, this uh, first part is, is almost over. And uh, I have to say that it's been a great pleasure uh, to chat with you today, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you again about the rest of your rich career. So do I, so do uh, I. Thank you for coming here today, John thank Simon. You.